previously in dark places. Just as plain as day, a solid black figure was in my bedroom, and I could see, like, the left side of his arm, his head, one of the shoulders. And the crazy thing is, is when I looked down the hallway, I seen it physically dart back into the bedroom. Like, oh, it saw me. There was two demons. They were blacker than the room, about two and a half, three feet tall. And there was one a little bit bigger than the other one. The smaller one of the two was kind of cowering behind the bigger one, like looking over his shoulder and red eyes glowing. Welcome to the show, guys. Today we are talking about MK Ultra and all the weird little experiments the government likes to conduct on people. If you've had a cool sighting or encounter that you'd like to tell us about, we'd love to have you on the show. Send an email to endartplacespod at hotmail.com. I took Brandon to Cowboy Lingo a couple days ago. That's the place where I had my first Sasquatch encounter when I was like three or four years old. Right. We hadn't been there for a while, so I thought I would take him and we'd uh, go on the hiking trails and stuff. When we went last year, I took him to a little park there, a little playground there, Cowboy Lingo, and there's a creek out going down in the bottom, and there was something sitting on the other side of that creek. Uh, I thought it was a dog at first. I pointed out to him. I said, you see that doggy over there? And he said, yeah, I see it. And it was uh, like a sandy brown, almost blonde color. And kind of looked like a dog sitting over there on the creek bank. And whenever we started getting closer to it, it took off. And when it did, it uh, didn't have a tail. And I was like, man, was it a bear? Because it looked, it had like a canine head. <laughs> really? And it didn't have a tail. It ran off on all fours. It had been real freaky. It took off on two legs. But it was just, uh, his on all fours the whole time we seen it. I just, it looked just like a dog sitting there. And I thought it was kind of odd. There ain't no houses there. Why in the world would a dog be there? Wow. And uh, it was scared when it seen us and it took off and didn't have a tail. It could have been a bear, I guess, but it had a head like a dog. <laughs> That's crazy, man. And it See, was... I've never had any kind of encounters like that. Not uh, that I would want one, really, but... The color of that thing was just off. Because, like, uh, basically, it's the wrong kind of bear to be around here. <laughs> just a uh, black bear, all you're going to see around West Virginia parts. Uh, I wonder if it would could have been, like, one of, the, one of them cinnamon bears, where they're a little reddish blonde looking. It could have been. I'll look at it and see if I see anything... Uh, if it was about that same color. It could have been like a albino or some kind of... On I know line. there's um, blonde ones that run around too, blonde bears. Many people are not aware of an experiment ran by the CIA from the 1950s to 1973 involving mind control. The project was called Project MK Ultra. CIA used U.S. citizens to develop interrogation and torture techniques. They did this by making uninformed subjects take drugs by administer hypnosis, driving them asleep, verbal abuse, and any other forms of torture. Their goal was to develop mind-controlling drugs that could be used against the Soviets. The U.S. government was already aware that Russia, China, and Korea were testing similar mind control techniques on American prisoners of war. Some of these drugs cause temporary or permanent brain damage. Many of these test subjects died from experimentation. The CIA destroyed most of the files pertaining to MK Ultra in 1973 prior to going public with all this. So nobody knows the true extent of what went on in those laboratories. They conducted hundreds of clandestine experiments. Sometimes it was on unwitting U.S. citizens. To assess the use of LSD and other drugs for mind control, information gathering, or psychological torture. 
Details of the program didn't become public until 1975 during a congressional investigation into illegal CIA activities. Sometimes the test subjects knew that they were participating in a study, but other times they had no idea, even when the hallucinogens started taking effect. CIA began to experiment with LSD under the direction of agency chemist Sidney Gottlieb. He believed the agency could harness the drug's mind-altering properties for brainwashing or psychological torture. CIA began to fund studies at Columbia University, Stanford University, and other colleges on the effects of the drug. After a series of tests, the drug was deemed too unpredictable for use in counterintelligence. Experiments took place in CIA safe houses. They would dose the men with LSD and watch the drug's effects on the men's behavior. Developing techniques for mind control to create a so-called Manchurian candidate. What is the extent of these brainwashing experiments? How did the CIA become involved in such far-reaching and disturbing research? Well, the definition of Manchurian candidate is a person, especially a politician, being used as a puppet by an enemy power. The term is commonly used to indicate disloyalty or corruption, whether intentional or unintentional. Uh, Project Superman, you ever heard of that uh, story? Uh, Andy Perro was one of these guys that got experimented on. He was involved in the Montauk Project toward the tail end of the operation. Montauk Project is another subject we're going to cover on the show one day. It's one of my favorites. Time travel and all that good stuff. Andy Perro wrote a book called Project Superman, talking about some of the experiments that he had and stuff he went through as a Manchurian candidate. I heard an audio copy of Andy Perro's book. It's a really fascinating tale. He would talk about being pretty much uh, indestructible. He'd see these men in black type guys chasing after him and stuff, and he would climb up on top of buildings and jump off and just take off running down the street, just stuff like that. For some reason, he, he couldn't be hurt after all the experiments and stuff they'd done on him over the years. He was an assassin for the Illuminati guys. He'd go out and kill about anybody they needed taken care of. One of the memories that Andy was able to uncover from his mind he was in an underground base, and he was escorted by Nazi handlers to a group of tall gray aliens. The grays were used to reinforce mind control more effectively for resistant slaves like Andy. He describes seeing two grays sitting at a table with three standing in front of him. He heard one of the grays say telepathically, you will obey us. And Andy screamed back at the skin-headed alien and said, look, knock that off or I'll kill you. Aliens continued their demands of obedience into Andy's mind, and he warned them a second time, I'll kill you. And then he focused his telekinesis ability to physically throw the commanding alien up against the wall. He split his head open, kind of like using the force. The other three aliens stood up, and Andy picked up another alien with his mind powers until the whole group of them scrambled out of the room. Sensing that the situation was getting out of control, one of the Nazi handlers grabbed Andy and said, let's get out of here. And Andy shouted back, I don't care, I'm indestructible. He later joked that the alien's blood looked like pea soup and a whitish gray color to the blood. He talked about lizard men that were almost seven feet tall. And they would sit in these chairs that would uh, kind of give them psychic abilities and stuff well here's a story i haven't read it all the way through but we'll just wing it and see what happens it says uh dateline january 6 2017 it says two months before esteban santiago allegedly unleashed a deadly assault inside the fort lauderdale hollywood international airport the 26 year old former national guardsman showed up unannounced and troubled at the anchorage alaska office of the fbi 
There, according to the FBI, Santiago told federal authorities that the U.S. intelligence agency had gained control of his mind and were urging him to fight for the Islamic State terror group. While the report was initially alarming, it was soon clear that the young man's reported complaint was more of a cry for medical treatment than a matter of meriting the attention of counterterrorism. During the interview, Santiago appeared agitated, incoherent, and made disjointed statements. The FBI said in a statement Friday night, although Santiago stated that he did not wish to harm anyone, as a result of his erratic behavior, interviewing agents contacted local authorities who took custody of Santiago and transported him to a local medical facility for evaluation. The FBI uh, closed the assessment on Santiago after concluding database interviews interagency checks, and interviews with his family members. A background check while revealing a brief military deployment to Iraq as a member of the Puerto Rico National Guard, no nexus of terror was found. Uh, the local Anchorage police authorities did not immediately respond to requests for a comment. Yet the troubling episode is now part of the emerging profile of a deeply disturbed man described by his aunt Friday as someone who had lost his mind. Maria Ruiz of Union City, New Jersey, said her nephew, who had moved to Alaska for work as a security guard, only recently began to show signs of instability. Like a month ago, it was like he lost his mind, she said. Uh, he saw things shortly after being informed that her nephew was a suspect in the stunning shooting that left five dead and eight others wounded. Ruiz showed supporters of a photo taken in September of Santiago at a hospital holding his newborn son. Staff at the Providence Hospital in Anchorage confirmed that the photo was taken at the hospital. In the photo, the young father wore a t-shirt emblazoned with a logo for the band Disturbed. Ruiz said that Santiago, whose mother lives in Puerto Rico, appeared happy after the birth of his son, but changed a short time later. She said he was hospitalized for two weeks, but she did not have any details about his condition. I don't know what happened, she said, before the FBI agent showed up to her door that the local authorities closed off the street near her home. It was unclear whether Santiago who was arrested without incident following the shooting, was cooperating with authorities, but by Friday afternoon, investigators were in, engaged in a far-flung effort from Alaska to Puerto Rico to learn what drove the suspect to open fire in the baggage claim area at Fort Lauderdale Terminal 2. So the story goes on and on and on. But, you know, it goes to say, you know, to me, this would explain a lot of the mass shootings that go on. Um, I'm not saying that these people aren't mentally unstable, but we know for a fact, I mean, anybody can go on the famous World Wide Web and look up MK Ultra, and it's straight up the government trying to control your mind. I hear this uh, sound frequency coming from the television that completely um, messes with my pineal gland. What happens is it releases the um, coiled serpent or the kundalini, which is at the base of the spine. How many times in the news have you come across, say, somebody, it don't even have to be like a mass shooting, just say kills their, they're just their family. They don't go out into public. They kill every family member in their home. And they act like they don't remember it. Or they say God told them to do it. Or the devil told them to do it. I don't know how this all works as far as how they control your mind. I mean, the, you know, the movie out there, Manchurian Candidate, I've never watched. I don't know anything about it. I know what a Manchurian Candidate is. But I don't know anything about that movie or much about that at all. Other than the government at one time was trying to make not only the perfect soldier, but the perfect hitman. Mind control research back home intensifies. The new goal is to cause an individual to become subservient to an imposed control, to the point where he will perform acts against his will and then have no memory of the act. The search for a real-life Manchurian candidate begins. To produce such an assassin, the CIA faces two main challenges. 
how to induce amnesia, and how to program in new behavior. And these guys would be trained, and as they were being trained, they were fed lucid drugs, LSD, acid, you know, these things that make your mind do things that your mind is not used to doing, I guess you'd say. But it could be just something as simple as, you know, a regular guy getting a phone call, and as soon as he picks up the phone, hears a noise or a sound or a word, and it just clicks on. He knows what his mission is. His mission is to kill. He goes and does that mission, and in the process, either kills himself, or after the mission, it's totally erased, and he don't remember any of it. I'm not saying that that's what this is, but I am saying I would not be surprised if it works that way. I used to always like watching the, the daytime talk shows, uh, Maury Povich and all that junk, and they would have the hypnotist guy on there, and he would hypnotize somebody else's audience, make them jump around like a bunny rabbit or whatever, and then he'd oh, yeah. say the yeah. key word, and they'd wake up and didn't remember anything. So it's, uh, it's along them same lines. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, why? I mean, why couldn't it? If you can hypnotize somebody like that, why couldn't you alter their thinking in that state? I think there's a lot to it. I mean, our government, we know, and it's not hard. I mean, I'm, I know people call me a conspiracy theorist and all this and that, but it's not hard. You can do your own research and find where these things have happened. Our government has more than you know. It's not the first time that they've used us as an experiment another example of that would be a topic that we've covered many times on this show suppose some government entity pays someone to create a virus in a lab then you get the media which you own and control the content of to pump fear into people 24 hours a day about how deadly said virus is more mind control what was that one movie that come out? Men staring at goats. Oh yeah. Where they were trying to read each other's minds and things. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a funny, you know, you kind of laugh at it, men staring at goats, but that's true. The government did that. I think it was, was Ed Dames. Yeah. Who talked about, he actually used to teach military people how to read and control other people's minds. As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against such fundamental laws of nature as self-preservation. So it's, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. You know, is there a reason why they use these mass shootings? Or if that's what they're doing, I'm not saying they are, but if, if they've got a hand in it, what is the goal? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and, and this is just one of my theories. I mean, I'm nobody. I sit behind this computer desk and I think of things and I just use logical thinking as much as I possibly can. But what could they benefit from showing a school shot up, showing an airport shot up, showing a place of business shot up or a mall or a store. One, it's more control. You're going to have to depend on other people for your safety, unless you're like me and would not be a victim. Um, I've said it more than once. I carry a gun everywhere I go. I'm legally able. I have a license. I've been trained, but a lot of people, and, and, when I say that, there are, if you're not comfortable with that, I don't suggest anyone going out and buying a gun and carrying it if you're not comfortable with it, because that can, that can be just as dangerous as, as not having it at all. But people, especially in our area, you know, when you get your birth certificate, they hand you your first gun pretty much. We are raised around that. We're raised around guns. We're raised around gun safety. We're raised around how to treat a gun. And if you're not comfortable with that, I mean, I understand. By all means, don't carry one if you're not comfortable with it. If you have small children, uh, I suggest, highly suggest, that if you own firearms, you keep them locked up. Keep ammo separate. But what this is going to do, when you see 
an elementary school shot up. And I, again, I just say, if, if this is mind control, it's another way of taking away your Second Amendment. Because when you see parents on TV crying because of their five-year-old little kid just got killed in a mass shooting at a school, it's so much easier to get that emotion and the first knee-jerk reaction is, okay, well, we need to take away the guns. Yeah. Well, believe me, I don't want to see anybody shot especially kids in a school. I mean, when you go to school, you should be safe. You should feel safe. You shouldn't have to worry about if somebody drops a book and it makes a loud noise. It's, oh my God, is somebody shooting? But that that tugs at you. And the first thing that people want to do is say, well, we need to take away your guns. That is the worst idea that you could do. Because just because you take away a gun from me, who is a law-abiding citizen, who has no intentions of killing anyone unless it's self-defense for me and my family, it doesn't even enter my mind. But you take guns away from me, the criminals still have them. Do you think a criminal who has ill intentions with a firearm is going to say, well, the government's taking our guns. I better turn my guns in. (laughs) No. (laughs) That's not how that works. That's not how that works at all. But what you can do is arm teachers. Let, on a volunteer basis, certain teachers have access to firearms just in case something like that happens. Because in most cases, the police are at least, at the very least, 10 minutes away. And I don't care if you have a five-round magazine. I don't care if you have a hundred-round magazine. You can do a lot of shooting in 10 minutes. Now, do you want to be hiding under a table hoping that that shooter doesn't come to you? Or do you want to be able to possibly stop that shooter and keep death to a minimum or at least injury? I think that's where if these mass shooters are MK Ultra mind control, I think that's part of the plan that's just my opinion but if you look at the mass shootings especially like uh well what uh, connecticut i don't know what their gun laws are up there i don't know if you're allowed to apply for a license and i'm sure you are but they some of these states make it so hard to apply for a, a license And I'm not saying anybody should just be able to walk through and say, okay, you have a license to carry a firearm. No, you should have a background check, an extensive background check on you. But people have to have the right to defend themselves and their families. They're going to have a ban on the semi-automatic rifles and all this. And like the criminals are just going to follow the laws and they're going to not be able to get those guns all of a sudden. But no, and and it, (laughs) it, 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 it doesn't work that way. So all that's sense. all that's doing is is hindering the law abiding citizens to be able to protect herself. Now I'm not saying like in the state of Ohio, you are allowed to defend yourself from if you think that whoever is about to kill you, you're allowed to defend yourself. You cannot, however. If somebody walks into your house and starts stealing your stuff, legally can shoot and kill them. Because in Ohio, you're not allowed to defend property unless it is arson. But getting back, I'm I'm going down another hole with that. But with the mind control stuff, I mean, if if that's what what our government's doing to, I don't even know if it's just ex-military or if it's just anybody they can do it to. What's stopping them from, you know, driving your car through a shopping mall or, you know, taking a machete over to your neighbor? You know, what, where, where would it stop? Now, you know, how, how many times have, you know, we've had snipers take people out and they didn't even know they did it, you know? There's a lot of evidence of celebrities being under mind control. And you can see their MK Ultra glitches on YouTube or just about anywhere. Kanye West. Y'all don't want to lose again. 
again. A lot of people here tonight felt like they lost. You know why? Because y'all been lied to. Google lied to you. Facebook lied to you. Radio lied to you. Britney Spears. It was pretty rough. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Oh, weird. Hello. Um. Oh my goodness. Hello. Ew. Strong Brittany. Um. Yeah, it was a weird. Ew. I'm in the first. Can we stop? Hillary Clinton, that one was really weird. She, uh, Look this one up. See if you can find the one of Hillary Clinton, like on the campaign trail of 2016. And she just freezes like a mannequin and a bunch of her aides and stuff had to like pretty much carry her to the van. They whisk her off and they just play it off that she was tired of stress or some nonsense. But she wasn't there. Lights were on, but nobody was home. She was just a shell standing there. It was freaky. I remember Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. He had a weird little meltdown at one time too. Tom Cruise, Shaquille O'Neal, pretty much any celebrity that you see, they're all under that MK Ultra mind control. Not sure why. Maybe they want to just protect the fact that they're all Satan worshippers and they don't want them to accidentally say the wrong thing on TV or something. I don't know. Al Roker. That one was a weird one. Look up Al Roker glitch. Tell me if that ain't freaky. But there's a lot of celebrity glitches. It's not normal behavior. You just know it's some kind of weird mind control. I tend to think every time I think of MK Ultra or any kind of mind control or mind altering anything, I always think that it can be used to have more control over us, be able to alter our Constitution, especially our Second Amendment. And it takes your right as a American citizen to be able to defend yourself. Yeah, there's so many guys in history that have done crazy junk. Uh, Mark David Chapman would talk about how God told him that he should kill John Lennon. He just sat there waiting for the police to come and get him. Like he'd just kind of right. waiting for the code word. He'd shut down. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm sure if, you know, if, if MK Alter really does work and, and they do things like this, how do you distinguish mind control from mental illness? It would, it would be almost impossible. You know, they always come back and say, well, this mass shooter, um, was on the radar or this and that, or it was just the opposite. And nobody ever seen him or heard from him, or he was a nice guy. And, you know, they talked to the neighbor and, oh yeah, he, we would talk. He was cutting grass. He'd stay to himself. He's quiet. But then he went into a school and shot, you know, 10 kids. Those are the ones that make me think that it's MK Alter. The guys who are, screaming about the government and wanting to kill, you know, senators and governors and all this stuff. Those are the guys I think that are more mentally ill versus mind control. But that's just my opinion. There's so many different, uh, like the Las Vegas shooting and just like that. It's so many different times in history that it could have been something like that, but they always had their trail. So you don't really know. <laughs> And the thing is, most of the time, they kill themselves. So you don't really, you know, the police and FBI and, you know, CIA and all these guys who are expert at, you know, reading people and, and, and interviewing people, they never get that chance. So then they have to construct everything. And even if they come down and find that it was my control, they're not going to tell us. <laughs> We're more apt to hear about UFOs from the government than we are MK Ultra. I remember, was it Clinton that apologized for the mind control experiments and stuff? 
Uh, yeah, I was going to bring that up, but I wasn't real sure if it was him. And shortly after that, didn't Columbine happen? Yeah, I believe so. It was uh, right around that same time period, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was. You know, a lot of people, you know, people don't usually pay a whole lot of attention to say, you know, somebody walks into a grocery store and shoots three or four people. Yeah, it makes the news and things, but it doesn't make the news like somebody walking into a school. I guess it wasn't directly MK Ultra. It says Clinton apologized for radiation tests and experiments, compensation for some of the victims and their families for about 4,000 secret studies since 1974 have been disclosed. He apologized to the families of those who were unknowingly subjects of government-sponsored radiation experiments and ordered his cabinet to devise a system of relief, including financial compensation. I was thinking it was just about MK Ultra, but I guess it was just pretty much any kind of weird government experiments. But that tells you that they've been going on for how long? <laughs> The uh, Project Montauk, that was like uh, 1946. Yes. And Montauk it was, Island. It was back that far, and they said it had been going on for 40 years before that. <laughs> this had just been going on forever. Well, I did read, and this is kind of totally kind of off topic, but I did read a um, report. I think it was an actual CIA report about Montauk Island, and that's where Lyme disease come from. They were working on a, well, well, they were working on Lyme disease, and what they were going to do was drop these ticks over, I can't remember what country it was. Uh, I don't think it was Russia. But anyway, anyway, whatever country it was, they thought that the Lyme disease would progress faster than what it did, and what had actually happened, some of the ticks got loose, got out, and got on the birds on Montauk Island. Well, when the birds would fly off, they had Lyme disease infested ticks, and that's that was back in the forties. So that's how we end up with Lyme disease and ticks. Thanks, government. Again, <laughs> yeah, they always have these brilliant experiments and things like that. Well, I think it's always one of them things that always looks good on paper. It <laughs> looks real good on paper, but. <laughs> I saw where our buddy Bill Gates is releasing a bunch of genetically modified mosquitoes in the U.S. So that's got good news written all over it. Bill Gates funded company releases genetically modified mosquitoes in the U.S. Genetically modified mosquitoes have been released for the first time in the United States as part of an experiment to combat insect prone diseases such as dengue fever, yellow fever, and Zika virus. UK-based biotechnology firm Oxitech, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, said it released the mosquitoes in six locations in Monroe County, Florida's Keys. Two on Cujo Key and one on Ramrod Key. And three on Faka Key. It's part of an effort to help tackle a disease-transmitting invasive mosquito population. The Andes Egypti, Egypti mosquito species is responsible for virtually all mosquito-borne diseases transmitted to humans, according to the company. These mosquitoes make up about 4% of the mosquito population in the Keys, and they transmit dengue, ziki, yellow fever, and other human diseases, as well as heartworm and potentially deadly diseases to pets and other animals. The experiment is in collaboration with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District and was approved by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Independent Advisory Board. So it's a good thing that they're putting those out because those diseases that were listed are extremely rare. So it's one of those things where it seems like they're going to do more damage than they do good. So I get this thing. It says, do you believe in the Mandela effect? I'm not sure what to think on that. That's... Well, that's me. That's why I was kind of wanting to get your perspective on it, because I'm not. Do I think time travel is real? I don't see how it could be. Not not by humans. Now, I think there 
are things that travel interdimensionally then and in, and in that way possibly but do i believe that people can actually travel different time no that's i mean well you got to hit like 88 gigawatts and <laughs> the flux capacitor type thing no this is what makes time travel possible the flux capacitor yeah, it don't seem real likely to be possible, does it? I I don't see how. Take just basic science, uh, trees and stuff growing in nature and stuff, and you go back in time and you're just, all that stuff's just going to physically change around you. I don't, I don't see how it could work. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, oh, that's a rabbit hole, man. That's uh... a... <laughs> Now, see, I hate to get all bible but when God created the Garden of Eden, I do believe that the trees and things that were in the garden was made with the fruit already on them. Because if you take the Bible literally, and then everything was made in six days, then there had to be fruit for Adam to eat. So I think in that way, things were were made or born or conceived in their full state. But I don't know. There's so many things out there that we don't understand. And sometimes there's things out there I understand that I wish I never did. <laughs> that uh, Mandela effect. There's a bunch of things that don't make a lot of sense to me, like in that uh, Goldfinger movie, uh, James Bond, uh-huh. where the girl is smiling. Uh, like the the guy had he had braces in the movie, and like his whole deal was he couldn't get a woman and everything. And then there at the end of the movie, he met this girl, and she walks out through there, and she smiles, and she's got braces on too. And like, oh, it's a love connection. They they're going to hook up and everything. But now, to watch the movie, the girl does not have braces. And it makes no sense at all. <laughs> uh, I never really thought about it. <laughs> I think that was Goldfinger, right? I can't remember. I'm not a big James Bond fan, but I remember there's some James Bond movie. And even I remembered seeing the girl smile with braces on at the time. I was seven or eight years old when it came out. I remember that was like the whole gag for the movie. Like, oh, she's got braces. But now she don't. (laughs) I've never seen it. I don't. The girl's name is Dolly in the movie. And Moonraker. That's the name of the movie. Moonraker. Well, see, I know them when I hear them, but I never. I think the only one I ever, ever really watched was Goldfinger. That Mandela effect, that's. uh, that's pretty interesting stuff to jump into. we we'll do a show on that one, too. I'd have to learn more about it. I don't know exactly what it... I know it has something to do with time travel and different things, but I don't really know the core of of what it's about. I tried to link the first case of it to Nelson Mandela. Uh, he was supposed to have died in prison back in the 90s. And he actually died after he got out of prison, like 2006 or something. Uh, I remember, I think I might have been listening to Art Bell the first time I ever heard of the Mandela Effect. Uh, Art was talking about it, like in 98, something like that. And he was talking about, he believed, he remembered that too, that Mandela died in prison. And he was talking about junk. And I was like, yeah, see, like I do remember that being on the news and junk. I was listening to that. James Reed episode of Art Bell, and uh, I guess it was like the second time around, like on the Midnight in the Desert, he had brought yeah. him back, and they just pretty much copied the first interview. Kind of strange, uh, but people in the comments were talking like Art was still alive and stuff. They didn't have a clue. I was like, man, it's just wild that people had never heard of him. They're just now discovering him and stuff. And you know, he had one of those voices that as soon as you heard it, you knew exactly who that was. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's it's like, you know, when I was younger, you know, you, you distinguish things like that. And 
Walter Cronkite was one that comes to mind. Every time I heard his voice, I always knew that it was him. <laughs> there was no mistake in it. And Art Bell had one of those voices. It's just as soon as you didn't even have to, you know, you could hit the, you know, seat button on your radio in the car. And if it just played a five second clip, a four second clip, you knew <laughs> that was Art Bell. He had one of those distinctive voices. There's no doubt about it. It's like James Earl Jones. You hear his voice, you don't even have to see a picture. You know who that is. <laughs> James Earl Jones, that uh, that made me think there's that Mandela effect thing about Star Wars. Like everybody remembers that uh, Luke, I am your father, but on the movie now you play it back and he's saying, no, I am your father. Right. I don't know. Maybe there were t-shirts or something out at the time i i'm not real sure it would say luke i'm your father and maybe it just kind of spread from there and it like a false memory type thing or something. Uh, so my not... son my son-in-law's name is luke and i tease him with that all the time <laughs> luke i am your father <laughs> that's about all the time we have for today we hope you've enjoyed the show if you've had an experience and you'd like to be a guest on our show, send an email to endarplacepod at hotmail.com. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>